We are in a little mini-series about being generous. Oh, no, he's going to talk about money. I hate that when they talk about money. All they care about at church is your money. All they want is they want you to come to church and give you money. And I listen, I understand that. I grew up in a culture of the 1980s. And I love the 1980s. The 80s were amazing. Uh, women used to put their hand in a socket and used to drink their hair like that. Then they'd take Aquanet and make it stuck that way. Uh, <laughs> I remember in the 1980s, the women had bigger shoulder pad, pads than football players. Remember that? Yeah, 80s were great. Yeah, it, it was all about it was the me generation. It was excess. Everything was excessive. And so, but I loved it. I, uh, the best music ever is in the 1980s. Can I hear hair metal? <laughs> Can I hear power ballads? Come on. Journey. and oh, oh, I used to love that kind of stuff. All right, all right. So I come to you with open arms today. But... Uh, Love the A's. The rest of you are like, what is he talking about? The 90s rule. All right, I get it. I get it. I get it. But it's good to see everybody. And, but I understand that sometimes we, we pe- talk about money all the time. But I know a lot of people that struggle with this. I do. Do you, you ever get tired of rich people? I mean, be honest. I mean, my wife and I and our family, we drove up to Marble, New Jersey, and my brother, and we drove through this neighborhood. And I kid you not, every, every house there, the cheapest house I saw was like 1.1 million. We're looking on Zillow to say, what do these people do? My God, what do they do for a lot? Le- I mean, they got tennis courts in their, in their backyard. They got pools. And I mean, I'm not talking about nice pools like with rock formations and, and these huge houses. I mean, huge houses. Look like the mafia or something. You know, I grew up in New York, so I understand a little bit about that kind of thing. But it's like, it's probably mafia money, right? So you're driving around, see all these great, great, great houses. And you're like, what is going on? What do these people do for a living? You ever feel that way? And now you're like, what's the deal with this? And oh, how come these people are doing so well? And it's, it's irritating, all these rich people. And, and you, you, you don't think you have the same amount. And, and you mean, I struggle with them times. Maybe I'm the only one. And so, God, why do all these people prosper so much? Meanwhile, we're struggling, right? And then you take your $1,000 phone. I don't know where we get the money to do that, but somehow we have enough money for a $1,000 phone. And you're flipping, and you're seeing all these people living an amazing life, right? Everyone's got white teeth, even though they drink coffee every day. It's amazing. There's no wrinkles on anyone's faces. They look beautiful. All the kids are like ducks in a row, all behaving. Meanwhile, your kids are tearing up on the house. You see them, they got, they're on vacations together. They're in Paris together. You can barely go to the West Farms Mall and they're in Paris. And you're like, what's the deal with this, right? And, and so you're looking at these, all these rich people. It's, it stinks. Like, why can't I be that? And you're thinking, man, if I had that kind of money, I would help people. I would make a change in life. I would do a lot more than that. These people have so much money. All they do is spend it on themselves. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but we're coming into a new year, 2024. And it's going to be an election year. All right. And we're going to hear a lot about the haves and the have nots, right? And so we often demonize the poor and we demonize the rich. And so when are you rich though? The question, when are you rich? When are you full of money? What's so interesting is this, you know, what's so interesting. If you make $45,000 a year, you're like, I'm really struggling. Someone else is making 90. Man, if I could make 90K, man, I'd be in it. Then you make 90K and you're like, man, if I can make 150, 150, I'd be really rocking and rolling, right? Then you make 150, you're like, man, the person that makes 250, man, they're the ones that make all that money. And so there's always someone higher. And where is that rich line? Where is it? Where are the rich men north of Richmond? And so you struggle with it and you're, you're frustrated with it. Where are all these rich people doing? Why can't I get ahead? If only I had that amount of money, I'd be a lot different than these people. We begin to think that way. In fact, the Bible talks about those rich people, which I like. What a socket to them, right? And so what does the Bible say about those rich people? It says this, teach those who are, are rich in this world. Let's see Apostle Paul talking to his, his protege, Timothy. He saying, hey, this is what you deal with those, you know, those rich people. That's what he says. Teach those rich those who are rich in this world, not to be proud, right? Why do you have to flaunt how many clothes you have, right? Why do you always have to have a new outfit? I've never seen you in the same outfit. As you notice, I wear the same thing every week. Anyhow, so, (laughs) but you always, isn't it amazing, right? So not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. Tell them, to use their money 
to do good, right? You don't need to go on those vacations. You need to help the poor like I am, all right? They should be rich in good works and, and generous to those in need and always being ready to share with me, with others. <laughs> By doing this, they will be storing up for their treasures as good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. So this is what they should do. Now, this is very interesting. I, I just read the survey this past week. This is brand new information from the Empowerment Financial Happiness Study. What a study, okay? <laughs> People have too much time on their hands, but that's beside the point. They make too much money. All right, so what, what is the salary it, it takes for Americans to be happy? You know what it takes for, that for according to a survey of men? It takes $318,000 for a man to be happy. I'm a lot easier than that, everybody, okay? I'm a lot easier than that, okay? Okay, and, and for women, you, you wait till you hear this one, right? The women? It should be switched, right? I don't know, I don't know who took this. I, think, I, I don't know why the men need more money. I guess they're married to women. That's the reason why. You never have enough money, right? Guys, come on. All right? And the average is 284. So I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? What's the story with that? How much money is enough? I don't know if you've noticed this, but we were driving to New Jersey and we found out they're paying $18 to work at McDonald's. $18. I'm like, I'm sending my kids to New Jersey to work. <laughs> Get a work visa, man. $18. And, 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 and to buy like a, like a, a meal at McDonald's that a, a man can eat, it's like 16 bucks. The other day, Luke and I, we went to Subway. I hadn't been to Subway in years. You know how much it cost me at Subway? $30. I used to get a five foot long for $6.98 with a packet, with a box that looked a little thing of chips, man. And it was $30. And you think that's bad. Go to, go to the other place, the other sub place, and you'll walk out. You need to take a re, refinance your house for that one, right? How about stop and shop or the whole paycheck? You go there and you, I mean, that's called Whole Foods, by the way. So yeah, so, I mean, everything has gone up. But what are you supposed to do? And this is what we found. Being rich is a moving target. There's always someone richer than you. In fact, they were talking to these well-off business people that were making hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they asked the question in the Gallup poll, how much would it take for you to feel happy and comfortable? And this is what they said. About $5 million in assets, and I would feel pretty good. Okay, I'd feel pretty good too, right? And so, but there's always something more. There's always someone that drives a better automobile. Someone's going out with a better person. Someone's living in a better house. Someone drives a better car. I mean, you're sitting here at the light. There's a boom. You're like a big, you know, big black smoke coming out of your pipe. And there's a person next to you with a brand new Mercedes. Electric. <laughs> One of these days, they're going to be found on the road dead with no battery. And you're going to laugh at them. <laughs> okay. But this is the truth. There's three billion people on earth. Okay, and four and, and out of the three billion people, it's eight billion people on the earth, and three billion people make four to five dollars a day. Do you realize if you earn three thirty two thousand four hundred, that would put you in the top four percent of the world? Four percent of the world. Now, if you make, I think if you make sixty k, right? If you make sixty k, you are in the top one percent. You are in the top 1% in the world. Now, come on, everybody, let's think about this for a moment. Do you know in China, you have, to go, you have to go in a lottery system to be able to drive an automobile? And there are people around the world that would long to have the car that you have that backfires, right? They would love to have your car. Why, in America, we have cars, not just one. Let's be honest, some of you came today with five cars. One for you, one for your kids, right? One for your grandma, one for your in-law, an outlaw. All of them in common cars, right? And not only that, but we build little houses for cars. It's called a garage, right? We do that too. So we, we, we have a lot of money. In fact, if, I don't know if you've noticed it, but uh, I, I don't know what, what happens sometimes. I, I heard it, but this happens. Not in my house, but I heard of women going into walk-in closets and saying, I have nothing to wear, right? I have nothing to wear. I mean, we, we have like, we have to pay money for storage facilities because we have so little, right? We have to pay, I got to pay 
$80 a month for a storage facility for things I don't even care about, but I'll have to have my stuff. So we have all this, I mean, we can overeat, right? If we're hot, we put the air conditioning on. Thank God. Thank God for air conditioning. When I go to heaven one day, I'm going to find who is the guy that invented air conditioning. I'm going to give him a big high five. We can turn the heat on, right? So we have all this wealth. We have, a, we have choices. And so compared to the rest of the world, we're rich. My grandfather was born in 1898, and they had, a, they had to go in the backyard, and they had to take a pump to get water. They had a, they used something called an outhouse. You know what an outhouse is? It's a house that's out. And they used an outhouse to go to the restroom, right? They had no running water. Uh, and so my, and my father was born in 1935, and they, they walked up to school barefoot in snow both ways. So it was bad. Okay, anyhow. But, but nevertheless, I mean, we have a lot of money today, a lot of wealth today. We don't recognize it. We have these, these $1,000 phones where we're comparing how lousy we have it. And so we're not aware of the fact, when is enough enough? So the being rich is a moving target, and the good news is this. You're rich. Look at your neighbor say, you're rich. Now tell me your real name. My name's not Rich. My name's Eric. Guys, listen, you guys are pretty much all filthy rich compared to the rest of the world. We are. Yeah, that doesn't help me at all because I have to compare myself to other people. Well, hang on with that. Okay, so the bad news is you're rich. And that much is given, much is required of us. Now that you know that you're rich, what are we supposed to do with our riches? What are we supposed to do with our riches? Here we go. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell the context of this. This is Jesus when he came into contact with the rich young ruler. There's a young guy, you know, a, a kind of a, a bachelor. Every, okay, I, I, I'm a father, right? And I, if, if I would love my, my daughter to marry a rich young ruler, right? I mean, I, I want someone that has a lot. So here's this rich young ruler, all right? He says, what must I do to be saved? Well, you know the commandments? He did all the commandments, I mean, he probably went to the synagogue or let's kind of switch it to our culture today. He came to church. He went to, he went to Yale University. He helped the food. He, he went on the humanitarian trips. He was fantastic. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He had a six pack like me, okay? Not a keg. But anyhow, he was a good looking guy. He was an outstanding person. He was good looking. He had a lot of money, right? And if he were to come to our church and you had a daughter, you're like, hey, this is the, I want my daughter to marry this guy, right? This is an outstanding person. This is the person you want to put in leadership in the church. They, they, they come to church, they dress well, they give, they're, they know they're good people, right? They come to church all the time. They go on mission trips, they give to the poor. Let's put them in the church leadership. And this guy had everything. But what happened is Jesus said this to the man. You want to follow me? Go sell everything you have and then come follow me. And the man walked away sad because he had much wealth. How many times do you and I walk away from what God has given us? The other day I was reading in, in the morning on a devotional time and I came up with this phrase that our tender is surrender. And tender, if you think about tender, it's like tender would be like how you spend money. That's your tender. And your, our tender should be surrender. That God, whatever you need, it's, you, it's for you, God. I'm gonna surrender to you. And that's the key to life. But the problem is we think riches are it. We do it today, everybody. We do it today. We sell ourselves for money. And this is what Jesus says about this whole thing. After he gets done talking about the rich young ruler, he goes to this. He says, for it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I heard a great sermon a number of years ago about some guy that has to go in the days of the New Testament, they'd have to, the guy would have a camel with a bunch of stuff, and he'd come to this gate, it would be the eye of the needle. The only way he could get through to take everything off the camel and squeeze on through. It was a great sermon, I loved it, but it's not true. The eye of the needle literally means the eye of a needle. So Jesus is saying it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than a man to enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Then, and the disciples like, well, who can be saved then? And Jesus said, with, thing, with God, all things are possible. 
You see, the deceitfulness of riches. It's not, we'll talk later, it's not money that's evil. It's the love of money because money gives us options. Let's be honest. I'd rather have more options. I want options, and so do you. When you have money, you have more choices. You can wear different things. You can go on vacations, right? You can do all these wonderful things. You can buy a big, bigger house, and you can send your kids different ways. You can go on these elaborate vacations. You can eat out every single night, right? And this is what begins to happen because you have money. You have choices, and sometimes you feel as if you're better than other people because of it. So he says it's easier for a camel. What are you supposed to do? He goes on and says later on in another passage, he says this, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Wherever your treasure is, is your desire. So if, if I love my family and I love God, my, my treasure is going to be the, the, my family and the money will follow it there, not my treasure. He goes on to say this, don't store for yourself treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Have you noticed how moths only, only go after your good clothes? It's like they know, I'm going to take them off. They, they don't go after the sweater you had in high school, but the sweater you just, okay, don't get me started, okay? Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And then he goes on. It's like, what does this have to do with the rest of the passage? In verse 22, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? What is he talking about? It has nothing to do with it. Yes, it does. What he's saying is this. Jesus is saying this. Whatever you put in your eye, Whatever you look at fills your life. So if I'm looking at money, that's going to fill my life. You see, God says you cannot serve both God and money. You have to choose one or the other. So if God is in front of your eyes, it fills your life. And then you navigate your life uh, to God's will. And if it includes money, that's fine. But it's not your God. But if money becomes your God or popularity becomes your God, it fills your life and it makes you dark. You're not even aware of it. That's what Jesus is saying about money. But when your eye is unhealthy, you're full of darkness. So God does not bless giving. Notice, it's a semicolon. Here it is. God does not bless giving. He blesses giving with the right heart. I grew up in the 1980s, as I shared with you earlier. In the 1980s, there was something called the prosperity gospel, where now these churches are doing pretty well for themselves. The 1980s was a great time. You could make a lot of money, and things were going well. And they used to tell you these things. And these guys would get on TV and say, hey, I want you to call in right now. Buy a $1,000 vow. Put a seed of faith right now. Hallelujah. Call in right now. Ah, right now, there's a woman in South Dakota. Right now, the Lord told me, you send out a $1,000 vow, and God will bless you. You know, you say that, and, and then they go, ah, ah, ah. they always like, I always like clear their throat. And sure enough, the lady from South Dakota would call up, and she would give $1,000, and sure enough, she'd be on a, a cruise, you know, a, she'd be on a wonderful cruise, and she's driving a Mercedes Benz now, and praise God, I gave the preacher, I was my last medication, I gave it to the Lord, I can't eat my seed. I have to throw my seed to the Lord, and I can't eat my seed. And sure enough, she's wealthy. And then you hear somebody else, right? And you hear this all the time. You hear, oh, come on now, test me and give me money. And watch what God will do. Watch what God will do. I want you right now. I think God says you need to give. Give and you will be given unto you, shaken together, pressed down in your lap. <laughs> and then they go like this. They go ah, like that. And they, they jump. I don't know why they jump, but they jump. And they go on and all these theatrics. And, and sure enough, and it seems to work for some people and they're doing well. They're making money. Things are going well. Like, wow, this is fantastic. And, and you need to give to the ministry. And here at Cornerstone, uh, if you want to find a husband, uh, you need to give to Cornerstone. Uh, we said, hey, God's telling you to. And they go on and like that. Can I get a witness? <laughs> people love it. And like, God, come on. And they start throwing money at the stage. God does not bless giving. He blesses giving with the right heart. 
You see, the good news is you're rich and we get to give, not give, not give to get. What good is it? Now we've turned God into a Las Vegas slot machine. Put your quarter in and, and hit the thing and watch what God will do. Once in a while, you'll get it rich. And so it's all about getting more. God doesn't want you. God has made you the head and not the tail, right? Oh, hallelujah, and I will trample on the enemy. And then you talk about all these things. I'm, I wish I was making this stuff up. One day, I kid you not, this is the, this is the truth. We were on vacation, pastors on vacation go to other churches. I think that's what Randy's doing today. So I went to, we went to this place in Long Island. I'm not going to mention the fact, the name of the church, because it's still in existence. And we're there. I kid you not, there's a man up there, and he gets up there. And says, God told me, someone today, I'm, I'm a king's kid. I, you're going to take care of your pastor. And, and someone today is going to buy me a Cadillac. <laughs> and my brother Dave was like, we just walked out of there. The guy basically said that someone, God is going to bless the pastor and give him a Cadillac. I mean, that's pretty sick, right? And, and then all the opulence and flying around. I, I, don't get me started, okay? And I understand there's some people out there to do for the right reasons. But that's not, if it does not work in Haiti or Nigeria, if the prosperity gospel does not work in Nigeria, then it doesn't, it's not gospel. The gospel works wherever you place it. Amen. So we don't give to get. We give to give. If God never did another thing for me, it would be enough because he saves me. I can be with God forever one day, right? That's, that's, the, that's the benefit. No, do I want him to bless me? Absolutely I do. But we don't, so we're training people to become greedy by giving. And it could be, you start, you, it could be, I'm gonna trust God with my tithe. And the next day your car breaks down. Your dog gets hit by a car. Your cat still lives. I mean, what are you going to do? Right? These things happen, right? And, and so maybe you're like, you're doing well. The next thing you know, you, your car breaks. You're going to put it on the credit card. And then your boiler goes in your house. You put it in the credit card. And you just tithed. Right? And now you send your dog to the vet. It's $5,000 to save your dog. Put it in the credit card. Oh, great, pastor. I tried this. It doesn't work. That's the wrong motivation. We don't give to get, we give to give. And my God will supply all of our needs, not our greeds. Why did God invent giving? Why? Well, he wants us to help provide for missionaries. God wants us, God wants us to give so we can help support the work of the ministry. And that's true in part. But you think God has trouble with the light bill? I mean, he might with Eversource. It's expensive, right? He's the Eversource, not Eversource. Okay, you, you need to tell them that. I'm not going to pay you because I have the Eversource. But all kidding aside, I mean, why, why, why did God invent giving? God didn't invent giving because he needs stuff. He did it for you. You see, God invented giving to work out greed and selfishness out of our lives, not to add greed and selfishness to our lives. That's why God has us to give. It's a test to keep us free. And so I believe in tithing. 10%. And Jesus even talks about it in Matthew 23, 23. You should tithe, he says, but don't neglect the other things. So everything I do, I bring, bring the tithe to the storehouse. I do that. The first thing that comes out of our check is the tithe. And that's okay, right? I believe that. But I don't do it to get rich. I do it because God's blessed me and I'm not going to let money control me. I'm going to trust God, but I don't do it to get rich. Does that make sense, everybody? Can you see how they take the scriptures and they take it and they just, and some of these preachers don't know better. They're just deceived. It just happens, okay? So we get to give, not give to get. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You think about it. Why in the Old Testament, what they would do, they would sacrifice their children to the God of Moloch so they'd have good crops. They would do all sorts of things to win a battle. They would kill their own children. Now today, do we do that? Now, I'm not condemning anyone here, but let's be honest. I've known people, and God forgives. Okay, please, this is not condemnation. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. God forgives and gives us new beginnings. But I've known people that said, you know, I, I can't afford to get pregnant right now. I've got to finish school, so I'm going to have an abortion. 
hey, we're about ready to retire right now and we don't need this extra child, so we're gonna have an abortion. Or how about this? You know, I can't, uh, my kids, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and subcontract them to someone else to raise. I, I gotta get more money. I have to get more money and I have to get more jobs. Have you noticed how expensive it is to raise kids, right? It gets expensive raising kids. They wanna join the travel fencing team or something. You gotta buy this $600, uh, $600 sword. Then you have to buy this face mask at $600. Then you have to get the cool leather jacket with the patches on it, another $600. Then you have to travel, another $700, right? Every time you say fencing, it's another $600. And the next thing you know, you're spending $3,500 for your kids to go fencing. And you're working extra hours and you never see them. What good is that? You, you follow me, everybody? It, it, and, and we're so busy providing for our kids that we don't spend time with them in church or even have them go to church and let them know this is important. I, I'm not against anybody. I'm just talking to what happens. We start, we start going after the American dream. I gotta be like the other people that are out there. Okay, it's for the love. And so what happens? For the love of money is a root cause of evil for which some have strayed from their faith. It can make you stray from their faith and their greediness and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. I like what Dr. Ben Carson said. Happiness does not result from what we get, but from what we give. One of the things they, they taught us, and we've learned this, that when you give, there's something released in your, in your brain. It's called oxytocin. It is the happiness feeling of a chemical in your mind. That when you give to other people, it feels good. Have you ever done that? It's like, it just feels good to give. Well, isn't that selfish? Not really, because you're doing it because you're designed. God is a giving God. And when we give, we act like God. When we give without strings. I'm gonna give, but I'm not gonna control you, right? It's not manipulation, not paybacks. No, I'm giving to bless, not because I want anything else. And so that's what we do. We give to be a blessing. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says this. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not what? Reluctantly or under what? Compulsion. You need to give now, ah! We're gonna shut the lights off. Ah. Can you guys shut the lights? No, just don't do that, okay. <laughs> or unless a compulsion for God loves a what? Cheerful giver, right? We, we, we get to give. So I wanna encourage you, everybody. As we are coming into the season of giving, I wanna encourage you to trust God. Realize that everything you have is from him anyhow. And we give because we, it's been given to us much is forgiven, much is, so much is given, much is required. So my job is to bless other people and trust God and watch what God will do in your life, in my life. We should be a giving people. Now, before I, I end, I, I do have to talk to the, the men for a few moments. And ladies, I need to tell the, the ladies something here. Men, there's something that men struggle with and, and it, we just do. And uh, you need to know what this is. Are right, you guys ready? Men don't like to share their food. They don't. So if you go to a drive-thru and you want to get waffle fries and, and, and your wife or girlfriend says, uh, and you ask her, you want anything? No, I'll just have yours. No, you won't. <laughs> Those are my fries. Even the ones in the bag, they're mine. I'll buy you four orders of fries, but you're not having my fries. Okay. <laughs> I say that as a joke, but... We want our own thing. We're selfish. We want our own thing. The truth of the matter is we must learn to be a people that are willing to give it all. That there's my tender is surrender to God. I am rich. I have a responsibility to make a difference. And I will worship God with, with my money, my time, and my talents. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a good God. You're a loving God. You're a compassionate God. And we want to thank you that you desire, Lord Jesus, that we would be people that are healthy. Father, we thank you that you have, in, you have blessed us so much to live in this place called the United States of America, where we are so wealthy. Father, we have so much. We want to thank you for what we do have. Lord, we choose not to compare ourselves to other people, but we choose to be thankful for what you've given us. And Lord, we choose to surrender today. We choose. We know we cannot serve you and both money. So Lord, our tender is surrender. Lord, we want nothing to come between us. We trust you. We choose to obey you. We choose to obey you. We choose to put your kingdom first and your righteousness. We choose to give not out of guilt, 
but out of delight. And Father, I pray right now that you'd break the power of materialism upon our lives in Jesus' name. Father, we want to trust you. And you said, test me and see if not, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing you would not be able to contain it. Lord, we think of that blessing may not be material possessions, but the blessing knowing that you're gonna, you promise to meet all of our needs and not our greeds. So Father, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray that the God of materialism will be slayed here today in Jesus' name. We choose to live within our means. We choose, oh God, to trust you. We choose to realize that no money and position and clothing and all these things do not make us happy. You're the only one. And so, Father, we thank you for that today. I pray right in Jesus' name that you'd break this power over our lives, that we would realize that you are God and every good and perfect gift comes from you. And you are the God that provides us our needs as we trust you by giving back what you've given to us because you're a good God in Jesus' name. Amen. Every head bow. Let me ask you a question. I do this every week because it's important. If you were to die today, do you absolutely positively know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus Christ? If your answer is, well, compared to everyone else, I'm pretty good. It doesn't work. There's only one name in which a man and woman can be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It requires two things. You've got to believe he exists. That Jesus is the Son of God. That he died on the cross for your sins. And he rose again from the dead. And then, here's another one you have to be able to do. You have to be willing to surrender your life and say, I'm not going to live, but Christ is going to live in me. You have to be willing to step out of control and say, I hand my life over to God. You must believe he exists. He rose again from the dead and must be willing to surrender your life to him. Otherwise, you're not saved. You're just following Christian philosophy. You're involved with the cultural movement, but you're not involved in the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to lead you into prayer right now. You bow your heads and close your eyes. How many of you would say, Pastor, I'd never give my life to Christ, but today I want to, or I've walked away and I want to get right, nice and high. Anyone say that this morning? Today, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time and renew my commitment. You want to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe, repeat after me in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to follow you. I declare you are God and I am not. I surrender my life completely to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.